Hello, today we're going to talk about the history of China at sea. 3,000 years of Chinese merchant fleets and navies going around the world. We are going to condense it in the next 40 minutes or so. Let's get on with it. The dragon and the sea. The dragon, of course, is a land-based animal, but as we can see, it can swim out to sea quite far indeed. And uh, today, we're going to start with the, an image of Admiral Zhang He. Zhang He was a pivotal figure in Chinese maritime history, the first admiral of the historical fl treasure fleet that we will talk about in a while, and uh, a symbol still today of Chinese maritime uh, pride. China traditionally has always been a continental power, and still today. It is so. However, and you can see that because the historical capitals of China were always inland, far away from the sea, Beijing, Datong, all these cities, uh, Chengdu, uh, with one exception, Hangzhou, that uh, you see on the lower right, that is on the sea and was briefly the capital of China in between the 10th and the 12th century, the current era. Otherwise, China has always politically, in terms of political power, been oriented inland. However, for a long time, the business hubs and the economy developed more along the coastline. You see here photos of Canton, now uh, referred to as Guangzhou in the 1880s and Shanghai in the 1930s. This is, this is where the economy of China and the pulsating heart of uh, the industry developed over many centuries. But let's go back a few centuries and let's start with uh, a story that is on the border between history and mythology. The expeditions of Xu Fu, the court sorcerer that the emperor of uh, Shi Huan Ti sent to Mount Panglai, this mythical mountain, probably in Japan or in some island in the Pacific, where uh, he, the emperor, wanted to find a special medicine that apparently had been developed there uh, to gain immortality. So he sent out Shu Fu with this uh, uh, kind of ship. In fact, he had 60 large multi-masted ships, the records show, 3,000 men and 3,000 girls, virgin girls that he was supposed to exchange for the medicine of immortality to bring back uh, to the emperor. Well, we don't really know exactly what happened. We know the first time around, Shu Fu came back empty-handed in uh, 2019 BC. So in 2010, the emperor sent him out again, uh, again with uh, more ships, more virgin girls. And this time he didn't come back empty-handed. He didn't come back at all. He disappeared at sea, never to be seen again. However, we go back to now more historical proven records. Uh, shortly thereafter, real trade uh, developed. And we all know about the Silk Road and the routes over the uh, Central Asian plateaus and the Middle East that the Silk Road and Marco Polo uh, and so on uh, developed and uh, used to trade uh, between China and the Middle East and Europe over the centuries, but there actually was a maritime Silk Road that you can see with the red lines here in the south. And uh, that is also important because this was uh, the first historical record of Chinese maritime uh, power. They used this kind of uh, this kind of ship, the junk. The word probably comes from the Javanese junk, which means boat. Many Javanese sailors came to China and manned these ships uh, for the Chinese emperor. It was developed roughly around the 10th century by the uh, Song Dynasty. They, Song Dynasty, also developed China's first standing navy. These boats were mostly uh, powered by oarsmen and they were focusing on patrolling the river against enemy ships or pirates and they were not really going out at sea much but the first 
fleet, the concept of the first Navy, naval fleet was established in the 12th century around the 11 and 32. The Chinese also innovated a lot at sea. And we can see here the uh, use of gunpowder, for example, was um, implemented into missiles that were rudimentary, but uh, for those time advanced missiles that could be used uh, to send projectiles onto enemy ships. Also the compass was used by the Chinese before anybody else uh, to find the routes at sea in a time, of course, when we nobody had yet uh, the use of GPS. Catapults were used at sea to shoot stoneware bombs, so clay bombs filled with explosive that were catapulted onto enemy ships during fighting. So how did the Chinese try and use all these uh, kind of arsenal uh, in the incoming decades and centuries? Well, the most famous was the attack of the Mongol dynasty, the Yuan dynasty that ruled China at the time uh, against Japan. There was actually two of them. The first in 1274, they attacked and uh, the Mongols, Chinese empire, actually managed to get ashore in Japan, uh, even though they were uh, defeated. They had uh, about 800 ships, the records say, uh, 2,000 to 40,000 men. Uh, they were not uh, very successful. The samurai, the Japanese samurai, managed to board Mongol ships as well, as you can see in this uh, image. And the fleet was defeated, destroyed. A few came back, but uh, the invasion of Japan failed. Seven years later, the uh, Mongols tried again, this time with a much larger uh, fleet of 4,500 ships. The records say <clears throat> up to 100,000 men were sent out to invade Japan, but they were defeated. This time they were defeated by the kamikaze. You know, kamikaze were always thinking of the World War II um, suicide bomber. Uh, pilots, uh, but uh, kamikaze in Japanese actually means the divine wind. And in this case, it was storms, typhoons that developed and uh, destroyed the Mongol Chinese fleet before it could even make it ashore to Japan. So the first major naval expedition by the Chinese under Mongol rule was not particularly lucky. So the Chinese in the subsequent dynasty, the Ming dynasty, decided to focus more on trade and arts. And uh, the emperor Yongle established what we now refer to as the treasure voyages between 1405 and 1433. Seven expeditions to trade, to send gifts to neighboring kings, and also to receive and to collect tributes from countries that China didn't invade, but they wanted to be subordinated uh, in a sort of feudal system uh, to China. The mastermind of these seven expeditions was Admiral Zheng He, the one I mentioned at the very beginning of my presentation, uh, who uh, lived between 1371 and 1435. And uh, he was a Muslim originally from the Muslim lands of Western China, was a eunuch at the court, was a very able diplomat and a capable explorer. And uh, he supported uh, the Emperor Yongle in all his um, struggles to take power and keep power. And uh, at two meters tall, he was said to have the, what the French say, the physique du rôle. He was a very imposing person. And uh, he managed to get the emperor to build these kind of ships, the treasure ships, uh, big ships, 135 meters long, multi-masted, and um, I think this is like about six times the size of the caravels used by Christopher Columbus at the same time. And uh, we don't have any surviving ship uh, to, to see today. However, we have... Uh, wrecks that have been located and you see for example this anchor on the right and a tiller uh, on the left that show you the immense size of these ships so these 
these expeditions were very successful. They they got um, a lot of friendship with neighboring countries and not so neighboring countries in Indian Ocean and as far as uh, East Africa. This giraffe on the left is an example of a gift given by an African king to the uh, Chinese emperor. Allegedly, it was the first giraffe ever to be seen in China. And ivory, ivory, very important because there was no ivory uh, in China, really. But uh, African ivory was used from that point on to produce exquisite Chinese art, like this sculpture here that you see on the right. And the Chinese also gave gifts uh, to these various countries. Obviously, Chinese porcelain was a staple for gifts as well as for trade. And Zheng He also gave the uh, this beautiful bronze bell to the Sultan of Pasai in today's Indonesia in Asia as a token of friendship. And then something strange happened. In 1435, these expedition, expeditions suddenly stopped. And historians have been uh, scratching their head ever since to try and understand why they stopped. One hypothesis is that the Chinese were too busy fighting the Mongols, who the, the previous dynasty, that was trying to get power again and, and putting pressure on the Ming uh, from the north, but we don't really know. The fact of the matter is the Chinese in, implemented what is referred to as the hygiene, the banned ocean um, policy. So no more trade, at least no private trade, but uh, they continue to allow state-controlled trade in terms of exporting uh, silk, even for Western churches, as you can see on the right of this photo, and uh, porcelain, of course. And uh, another reason why the Chinese might have stopped uh, trade with uh, other maritime powers at this time is that they were afraid of contacts with foreigners. They were afraid of cultural contamination, of threat, to the stability of threats to the stability of the dynasty. This is a theme that will recur in Chinese history: the fear of contacts with the outside world and the retreat uh, into the shell of the of the landmass of China. Another reason historians speculate about is that at that time, as today, in fact, the income inequalities between the peasants inland and the merchants and traders on the coastline, the income inequalities was growing too much. So the peasants were bound in their centuries old techniques and they really didn't get anywhere. Whereas the people living on the coast and the traders, the factory owners, they were getting rich and this was creating political problems in China. So isolationism, like in many other cases in his history, uh, however, uh, backfired. The um, Ming were not interested in importing anything. Uh, they, as I said, they banned private trade, uh, but um, they were getting poor monitoring, just monitor, patrolling the coastline to prevent private traders, smugglers uh, from trading was costing too much. Uh, the government was losing a hell of a lot of uh, customs of duty money uh, because the trade wasn't there anymore. So nobody was paying duties. And the uh, hinterland was not getting any richer anyway. <clears throat> and in fact, about uh, 1644 or so, uh, it was the rebellion of the a number of people, but the most uh, famous one is Li Zicheng, who was a peasant leader who in 1644 uh, rebelled and um, overthrew the Ming dynasty. So this policy of isolationism that was supposed to protect the Ming dynasty from outside influence, from social inequalities actually backfired and it brought down, brought it the, the, the downfall brought down the dynasty itself. This is at the time when, of course, Europe is 
engaged in what we refer to as the age of discovery. Um, and some of these discoveries actually led Europeans uh, to China, while the Chinese treasure fleet, all these wonderful ships, were left to rot in port. 1557, the uh, Chinese allowed the Portuguese to settle in Macau, and they would remain there for the next 400 plus years. This was a, an exception. And the, the reason why the Chinese, even though they banned contact with just about anybody else, but they allowed the Portuguese is because the Portuguese uh, helped the Chinese uh, to fight the pirates, the uh, people that were trying to uh, trade illegally, smuggling uh, stuff, uh, despite the Haijing, the, the ocean a ban that the Ming dynasty had imposed. We come back 130 years later, <clears throat> and uh, this isolationism becomes in unsustainable, and the Longqing emperor of the Ming dynasty decides to open up and allow trade. However, there were some restrictions, no export of arms, copper and silver, those were to stay in the country, and no trade with the Japanese, mostly because the Japanese had not helped uh, to fight piracy. In fact, many uh, argue that Japan was uh, helping and providing support to the pirates to um, continue profitable trade with China, uh, even in the times when this was uh, forbidden. And so this opening up brings to a lot of trade, uh, shipping routes being reopened. Uh, these for, are examples of trade from the 17th century and uh, that were found only uh, very recently. There is, of course, many wrecks that uh, dot the coastline of uh, eastern China all the way down to uh, Indonesia through Taiwan and all the way to Indonesia. And the testimony of these uh, of course, the wrecks that have been you now being found uh, shows us how, after the opening up, the trade became very flourishing again, indeed. However, that's not the end of it, because later on, the Qing also fell into the trap and implemented their own banned ocean, their own hygiene. They were concerned about uh, different things, but mainly they were worried about this gentleman called Kosinga, who uh, was a Ming uh, loyalist. Here we're talking about the Qing dynasty, of course. Uh, the uh, Ming loyalist uh, who had established himself in Taiwan had defeated the Dutch, a major feat at the time for a Chinese army to defeat uh, the Dutch, who were a great power in those days. And... Um, so the Qing dynasty, who had overthrown the Ming, now they also were concerned about these you know, outside influences and interference, and they tried uh, to lock the country up once again. The emperor Kangxi, 1661 to 1722, also continued the policy of hygiene. It would last well into the 19th century. However, he made an exception for himself and he built this beautiful ceremonial boat that he used on rivers and lakes mostly uh, to entertain himself and his court. That's uh, the only exception during this uh, long period of the Qing dynasty, the Qing dynasty, of course, is the Mongol dynasty, sorry, the Manchu dynasty that took over after the Ming. But foreign pressures building up, I mentioned the Portuguese, who as far back as the 1500s had established a bridgehead in Macau, but uh, many other foreign powers now wanted to trade with China. China, of course, was uh, very attractive from a trade point of view because of what it produced, uh, porcelain, silk, and so on and so forth, and also because it was a big market where Westerners wanted to export. And the four major countries that were involved in this were uh, the United States, France, Britain, and uh, the Netherlands. The 
Chinese eventually gave in and allowed limited trade. They issued a, a decree entitled Regulations on the Vigilance Toward Foreign Barbarians. Toward the barbarians, the foreign traders. They were only allowed to train from Canton, Guangzhou, except the Russians, who somehow were allowed in the north, because closer to the country, I guess. And um, the uh, prices were uh, controlled, and uh, also the contacts, only certain Chinese traders were allowed uh, to trade with foreigners. So it was a very controlled uh, type of, uh, of trade. But still, it, uh, it was a step toward opening up again. This is a photo of um, a British merchant uh, at, uh, at an auction, I think, in, uh, in Guangzhou. Uh, there was all kinds of limitations, as I said. For example, the, the Chinese could not borrow capital. They could not uh, get loans from the foreigners. And um, it, it was uh, still uh, rudimentary, but nonetheless, uh, a crack had been opened into the sealed Chinese empire that we had seen before. The problem for the Qing was that to enforce this block blockage, this sort of self-blockade of the country, they needed a strong fleet and they didn't have one. The Chinese uh, Qing Imperial Navy uh, fleet, uh, this is the flag of the admiral, the fleet, was very weak. And uh, when the United Kingdom uh, opened uh, fire uh, and started the first Opium War in 1841. Uh, China lost very badly. This war was started by the UK in order to open up the trade of opium, uh, of which China wanted a lot, and uh, the UK produced a lot in India, so as to be able to um, sell that opium to buy uh, Chinese tea, which was in great demand in the UK. Uh, in 1946, uh, after the war, you had a very unique expedition. Again, for the first time after centuries and centuries, a Chinese junk ship, the Qi Ying, uh, left the shores of China and traveled all the way to New York and London. And it was uh, seen as, uh, it, by these days you know a fairly backward beautiful ship but very backward very slow and definitely not a match for western sh naval ships uh, in a fight it was then dismantled after this ceremonial voyage and never uh, seen again so china's maritime trade is open now and uh, the chinese uh, called on this guy a, a british guy uh, to be inspector general of their custom service. Of course, if you've got trade, you need customs. And the Chinese wanted to make money out of customs and, and the duties paid by merchants. They had no experience in how to do this. And so they called on um, Robert Hart, uh, who took this job very seriously. He worked loyally for the Chinese government. He loved China. He even had a Chinese mistress. He wasn't really considered acceptable in those days to have a Chinese wife, but he had a Chinese mistress and three kids, and uh, they were educated in the UK, and he remained a figure loved and admired in China long after he left uh, in, uh, in 1911, including by Sun Yat-sen. So China is now open for business. And uh, um, the Western powers, however, are not satisfied. They want more. And the Second Opium War is um, started again by the British and the French this time. And uh, it results in another Chinese uh, defeat with the loss of uh, Kowloon to the UK in perpetuity and huge reparations paid uh, by China in silver. The um, purpose of this was, of course, to expand uh, further the trade, the international trade of China. And there were different provisions to allow uh, traders, remember, who had been limited to 
Guangzhou to Canton in the past and then Hong Kong to actually um, operate out of many harbors around along the Chinese coast. <clears throat> the Chinese realized that they actually need a fleet. They need a fleet that's worth the name. And they started uh, buying ships from abroad. <laughs> they couldn't quite make good um, naval ships at that time. So from the 1870s, they started to buy ironclad, the first ironclad ships, uh, mostly from Germany and Britain, but even from Japan, a traditional enemy country. And they formed four different fleets in the north, south, and Guangzhou and Fujian. This was not a very good idea because having four different fleets under four different admirals who didn't particularly like each other and didn't help each other was not going to make China's navy very strong. This is another example. The Chao Yong is another uh, ship that was bought uh, from the uh, UK. <clears throat> 1895, despite the strengthening of, of its fleet, Japan uh, defeats uh, China. And um, later on, it is Russia that defeats Japan. Um, so the result is that the foreign powers, Japan and Russia, establish a foothold in important Japanese uh, ports in the northeast, in what is now Dalian, Port Arthur, Lushan. So the Chinese understand the importance of naval, naval power. They try to build a fleet, to build four of them. They're weak, they're divided, they don't help each other. And Japan and Russia take advantage of the Chinese naval weakness to establish a foot, foothold on China itself. And in fact, many colonial powers established foothold in China in those decades. Uh, I mentioned Japan and Russia, but uh, of course, we know about Macau to Portugal, the UK in Hong Kong, but also smaller countries, um, uh, like Italy, like Austria-Hungary, who had not had traditionally a strong military presence in the East, they established extraterritorial entities on Japanese soil. All of this again because of the weakness of the Japan of the Chinese fleet. The biggest uh, weakness, of course, was revealed with the Japanese invasion of the 1930s when uh, Japan gained control of a large swaths of Chinese territory. The uh, Chinese the fleet is totally incapable of holding the sea frontier of the country. And this developed also after World War II all the way uh, to the late 40s and early 50s. You had uh, uh, foreign powers like the United States, in this particular example, who continued to patrol Chinese territorial waters, the Yangtze in particular, big important river for trade. And uh, the excuse was to protect uh, American consulates in, uh, up, the, up the river. But um, in fact, it was a way to continue to uh, dominate uh, the, the Chinese uh, economy, Chinese trade. Um, with military means. And again, the Chinese were incapable of uh, doing much about it. Uh, of course, they were very weak after the end of World War II. And of course, also, they were engaged in a civil war between the nationalists and the communists. I recommend you watch this movie, The Sand Pebbles, Pebbles with Steve McQueen and Richard, uh, Richard Attenborough about uh, this particular case of uh, the American uh, ship uh, Panay is the name that sailed up the river Yangtze. The British also had ships there. The um, There was fighting, the so-called uh, Yangtze incident in 1949, when the British were sailing up the Yangtze uh, to allegedly protect the British consulate in Nanjing during the Civil War, but the Chinese weren't very happy about this, and uh, they attacked the, the, the British and the British uh, retreated. Uh, the HMS Belfast, which if you're interested, can be seen uh, on the Thames in London still today. 
was involved in this particular operation as well. By the 1940s, end of the 1940s, so all the Western European powers have left China, the only exception, of course, being Hong Kong that remained British for a few decades longer, and Macau that remained the Portuguese until 1999, but otherwise everybody else has gone. Now you would think after all these defeats and humiliation, China would understand that it needed to look outward and to have a powerful navy. But in fact, with the Mao regime taking hold on the 1st of October of 1949 and the foundation of the People's Republic of China, China still continues to look inward. And it is preoccupied with various small fights relatively, you know, by Chinese standards, fights with the USSR along the border of the Usuri River in, in the 1960s and with Vietnam in 1979. So China, again, keeps its focus on the land army, on the land dimension of its armed forces. It needs a bigger army, the leadership that thought, and not a navy. Also, from the economic point of view, China is was pushing towards self-sufficiency. The Mao regime wanted to be self-sufficient, first of all, in food and also in heavy industry. And um, the, this motto on the left um, says, hard work and innovation are rooted in the countryside. And the poster on the right says, guarantee the grain harvest. So China is again looking at industry and agriculture inland, and is, it is not looking at exports, imports, or trade uh, at all. So there is no need for ships. This changes dramatically after 1976. What happens in 1976? Both Mao and number two leader of China, Zhou Enlai, die. And the succession struggle begins, and a gentleman by the name of Deng Xiaoping comes out the winner. He had been in government in and out several times. He had been purged by Mao, but he was powerful enough that he was ever he was never really you know, killed or definitively thrown out of the of the political play. He comes back and he says things like, "It does not matter if a cat is black or white." as long as it catches mice. Very pragmatic, you know, for Mao, the cat had to be red. It didn't matter if it caught mice or not, but it had to be red. He says it doesn't matter as long as it catches mice. Getting rich is glorious. Of course, you would have never heard this during Mao's time. So foreign trade is back in fashion, and it takes very little time to understand that the best potential to expand foreign trade is out at sea. And in the next few decades, China developed its merchant fleet in uh, tremendous ways, uh, both quantitatively and qualitatively. And today, about one third of the roughly 300 million containers that move around the world in international trade pass through Chinese ports. And China has the largest maritime fleet in the world, if you exclude flags of convenience like Panama and, and so on. So from being a self-contained, self-isolated uh, mystery wrapped into its landmass, China in, well, from 1976 to 2016, 20, roughly 40 years becomes the number one fleet in the world and the number one uh, trading hub of the world. Uh, Shanghai overtook Singapore in 2010 to become the busiest port in the world. And these are a couple of uh, photographs from there. And today, uh, seven out of the 10 busiest commercial ports in the world are Chinese. That includes Hong Kong, of course as a sign of the importance that China now gives to maritime 
uh, trade on the 11th of July. Now China celebrates the National Maritime Day. And this is the anniversary of Zheng He. Remember the Admiral of the Treasure Fleet, uh, the anniversary of his first uh, voyage. The museum opened in 2005, exactly 600 years to the day after Zheng He's first uh, voyage. You can see a statue uh, of Zheng He here on the right. Not only that, but um, China is now busy buying foreign ports. Uh, for example, it bought the controlling stake into the Greek port of Piraeus, uh, which was uh, bankrupt, essentially, and uh, it did not attract investors from Greece or the European Union, who would have had an easy way to take it over, but they didn't. And here it is, uh, Deng Sh uh, sorry, Xi Jinping going to the Piraeus Harbor with the Greek Prime Minister and uh, taking uh, control of the harbor. The harbor now works very well. It's been rebounding in leaps and bounds and it's, it's very profitable and it's once again a hub for international trade. So this map shows roughly what the new Silk Road uh, is about. You all heard about the Belt and Road Initiative, the infrastructure projects and so on. Kind of controversial sometimes because of debt issues that China has been developing with a bunch of countries in uh, Central Asia, Southern Asia, Africa, and Europe. But there is also a maritime dimension to the Belt and Road Initiative, both a southern one with routes and infrastructure being developed along the border of Southeast Asia, the coastline of Southeast Asia, India, the Middle East, uh, across the Suez Canal in Europe, as well as a very bold and um, ambitious initiative to develop a maritime trading route in the north uh, across the icy seas of the Arctic Ocean uh, around Russia, all the way back to Rotterdam in Western Europe. That's still work in progress. We'll see how that develops. But um, many of these infrastructures are already operational, particularly those in the south. We talked about trade and the maritime fleet of China and its new interest in opening up to the world. There is also a military dimension to the dragon at sea. And... Um, Unlike in, in the UK and Germany, in China, Navy, the Navy followed the development of the merchant marine. In, uh, in the case of the major European naval powers, it was the other way around. But be that as it may, China is now developing a formidable Navy as well. Submarine fleet. Uh, this is a submarine I actually visited myself. It's uh, open to tourists in, in Dalian, in the northeast uh, of China, and you can visit the inside of uh, a Chinese submarine. It's kind of interesting to see still some of the ideological symbols, but uh, otherwise it's a submarine probably similar to the ones you would find in comparable fleets around the world. This is what it looks like, and this is your presenter here uh, next to it. And uh, interesting, I found this uh, sign in one of the cabins inside the political commissar's office. And uh, <clears throat> it reminds us how the armed forces and also the Navy in China always remains under the political control of the party. Every submarine and every division, every Air Force wing has a political commissar, a uh, representative of the party who has the last word. Uh, not the captain of the submarine, but the political commissar of the Communist Party of China as the last word on decisions on the sub and, and on everything else. These are more modern submarines. I don't think we would be allowed to visit these. At least I, I, I haven't been uh, I haven't seen any way to visit the more modern submarines. China has both SSBN and SSN. What does that mean? The SSBN are the ballistic nuclear powered submarines like the one on the foreground in this photo that can launch missiles to strike targets at sea. 
The SSN are the submarine, the nuclear power submarines that only attack other ships or other submarines, uh, or presumably can launch cruise missiles as well to land targets. But anyway, they're smaller submarines, mostly used for Navy operations and not for land attack or strategic kind of uh, missions. Very impressive submarines. This is the um, newest uh, Jing class uh, SSBN that can send uh, missiles anywhere in the world. You can see on the top, uh, there are what 10 tubes, vertical tubes that can launch missiles into the sky. And China is the first Asian nation to have built a ballistic missile capable a nuclear powered a submarine. According to analysts, these are not as sophisticated as those built by the Americans or the Russians. However, they constitute a great leap forward, as Mao would say. And definitely, uh, the Chinese won't stop here and they'll develop better ones in the future. In terms of aircraft carriers, uh, this is a long way. Uh, from the uh, ships of uh, Shu Fu, uh, who is going to find, you remember, the medicine for immortality, or the Mongol ships that were uh, trying to invade Japan and they were uh, scattered by a typhoon. These are uh, first class aircraft carriers. The first two, uh, the first one actually was bought from Russia in 2012, and the second one. Um, it was built uh, in China and uh, commissioned by Xi Jinping. He chose this particular date to uh, inaugurate his new aircraft carrier because he knew it was my birthday. And so he chose the 17th of December of uh, 2019 to actually inaugurate the ship. Um, this is a photo of the third uh, aircraft carrier. This is completely Chinese designed, and it is the first that is going to be nuclear powered. And uh, so another major technological step forward uh, for China in the naval realm. And uh, there are plans that have been confirmed, but we don't have any images yet of a fourth aircraft carrier. So four carriers is not a huge amount for a big power like China. Think of the US. US I think has 12 or 13 now. Um, so it's still it's a fraction of the U.S. fleet. But if you think that China had nothing, really, just a few years ago, in fact, just at the beginning of the century had nothing, now you have already four, including a home-designed, nuclear-powered, uh, full-deck aircraft carrier. That's a pretty impressive step forward. And what is China going to do with these ships? This Navy that is now capable of, of this called Blue Water Navy is capable of going anywhere in the world. Well, one issue that I will uh, raise here, of course, China is going to be, it already is, but it's going to be more and more a global power. Um, one issue that is very contentious and um, it is uh, centered around the maritime issue is that of the South China Sea. Uh, that China basically claims almost completely to itself. You can see the so-called nine dash line. See the red, the red um, lines here in the map that uh, almost go to the beaches of the Philippines and Indonesia and Malaysia. Uh, of course, these countries are not very happy about this, but China says all of this is Chinese territorial waters. Uh, the others, of course, don't agree. There was, in 2016, a ruling by the Permanent Court of Arbitration that said that China had no rights to claim all these territorial waters, uh, all, all this, this surface uh, of the sea to itself. But, of course, China is not going to accept that. So now there are there are other countries, mind you, there is Vietnam, there is Taiwan itself, the Philippines, they all have occupied um, bits and pieces of these islands around these waters. But China, of course, being the biggest and most powerful, has occupied the most. We'll see how that develops, and hopefully it will be a negotiated solution 
uh, rather than a conflict. It's interesting to note that on this particular claim by China, uh, Taiwan agrees. It's one of the few things that Taiwan and China and mainland agree on, and that is the Chinese claim over the South China Sea in almost its entirety. We'll see how that plays out, but definitely the Chinese Navy is now an entity to be reckoned with and a powerful partner of some adversary of others, but a powerful actor in the scene indeed. And with this, I would like to thank you and I remain at your disposal anytime you meet me on the ship. And for you, those who are watching on YouTube, you can write in your comments, contact uh, me through the comments and I'll be happy to answer your question. Questions, thank you very much and see you at the next video.